Um, my name is John Ford, obviously, and I'll try not to keep slapping the, the mic because, you know, it says John Ford up here. I work for a company called Main Nerve. We do uh, security consulting. We do penetration testing, uh, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I personally am a web application penetration tester. Uh, it's what I, my focus is on, but I used to do regular network penetration testing as well. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about, well, um, I'll let you look at that while I talk about what we're going to talk about so that I don't have to read that slide. Um, today, what we're going to be talking about is using Wireshark as a baseline for, uh, or using Wireshark to create a baseline for uh, getting rid of all the traffic you know is good that you really don't want to see so that you can get down to the stuff that is actually bad um, or could be bad. We don't know for sure. Uh, anyone here ever done digital forensics on hard drives? Used end case or anything like that? Got at least one. Um, one of the, the functionality of end case and a couple of the other tools is they have a long list of MD5 hashes of files that they know are good files, files that belong to the operating system or, or whatever. Uh, so they can actually go in and they can use that to filter out everything that they don't want to have to look at. Uh, they've also got a list of MD5 uh, hashes of files that they know are bad, or maybe their uh, child pornography or their malware that they've been able to find. So then they can run that same list and pull out all the stuff that they want to look at, right? So the same basic concept is going to happen here uh, with Wireshark. All right, so we're going to create a baseline of your computer that allows you to generate a filter at the beginning of the moment where you feel like there's a problem with your computer, you turn the filter on, and now you don't have to sit there and weed through all the stuff that you already know is good. Make sense? All right, uh, before we get started, how many of y'all are like masters when it comes to Wireshark? You can turn it on and you don't have your head pop. No, I'm just kidding. Um, how many of y'all have at least looked at Wireshark before coming to this conference? All right, I was hoping so, because it'd be weird. How did you get here? Pick up somebody's badge and just walk in? Maybe, I don't know. Um, all right, how many of y'all have been to a class about Wireshark? Okay. How many of y'all have been to Laura's class? And your heads haven't exploded? All right, that's good. All right, so I'm not going to try to keep this too slow, but at the same time, this is interactive. If I say something and it doesn't make any sense to you, stop me, okay? We have plenty of time. I, I think I get an extra 15 minutes because I don't have to stop 15 minutes prior to 6, so I can go to 6. And I'm going to do it. I'm just kidding. Um, all right, uh, how many of y'all are familiar with the uh, display filters and the quick buttons? Anybody who's been in Laura's class is raising their hand on this because this is like her thing, right? The little quick buttons. How about display filter macros? A couple of y'all? I love these things. Uh, display filters are great because you have that little button that you can press where you save this really long string that's like 5,000 lines long, right? Well, display filter macro allows you to take that 5,000 long string and shorten it to a very short variable name. And you can actually create a button based off of that. All right? And you can take this display filter macro, add it to this display filter macro, add it to this display filter, uh, uh, filter macro, and, and daisy chain them all together. So we're going to spend a lot of time uh, in there. I know everybody who's been in Laura's class has done the coloring rules. Anyone who's not been in that class familiar with the coloring rules? Who's not familiar with them? Good. Uh, how about the statistics tab? Anybody never seen that before? Okay. Um, and then GOIP. Who here has or has not, oh, let's just say who has not used the GOIP before. All right. Uh, those of y'all who say you have not, do you know what it is? Some of y'all? Okay. Well, for the rest of y'all, the GOIP is basically, uh, there's a mind, uh, what is it, mind something? MaxMind, thank you very much. I knew you were paying attention. Uh, MaxMind uh, creates a database that will tell you the estimated location, uh, latitude and longitude-wise, or city-wise, or the ASN number of an IP address that is going through. So you can actually create filters 
based on that information. You can create a filter that says Russia or whatever, or that, that particular GOIP, or that ASN number, as you can see up here. Yes? Yes. Uh, I've got a, a video in here that I could show you on setting up GOIP. I may do it even though it's a little bit outdated because Wireshark has been forced to update to the, the new GOIP2 version. Uh, I say forced. It's obviously they want to keep up with the times. But um, the version in this particular uh, video that I did back a while is uh, outdated. But I'll show you all about it. All right, so whenever we use a filter, what's, what are we trying to do most of the time? Search. Search. I'm sorry, I'm having a search. Search for what? Uh, well, we're right, you read my slide, okay. <laughs> um, so typically when we're using Wireshark and we type in a filter, we're actually trying to filter out everything but what we want to see. Right? So let's say we're only looking for ARP. We always talk about ARP. We want to look for ARP packets. So we just type in ARP and now all we're looking at is ARP packets. Right? Very rarely do we as an as a analyst actually use the NOT symbol or something like that in front of it to exclude that as the filter and look at everything else. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to take advantage of that habit that we have and we're going to create a filter to show us what we don't want to see, and then we're going to negate that filter so that we are excluding that from our view, right? So that's the idea behind this. <coughs> okay, uh, display filters, we have a lot of different places where you can go to get uh, examples of valid filters. You can actually go to this site here, right? And you can also, inside of Wireshark, Nice, there's a couple of different ways that you can go about it. Let's make sure that's showing up up there. Um, when you start to type in a filter, it's, uh, I can try to. Uh, let me see. This one? Well, all righty then. So, is that big enough or we want it larger? How about those of you on the back? All right. it's, not, it's not too significant that you can actually read that. Um, you're welcome to do it on your own. Um, yeah, okay, so it's not gonna change the, uh, the size of, of this part over here, um, unfortunately. Uh, but if you type in IP in a period in the, in the search bar, you're going to be able to see the different options that are available to you, so you don't have to guess, right? Um, you can also go and build your own expressions uh, by clicking on the expression, go find, find the, the uh, protocol or, or the standard that relates to what you're looking for, and you can build it out that way as well. And then, of course, my favorite uh, way to figure out how to do a filter uh, anybody want to guess? What's that? Well, you, yeah, that one doesn't fall in my favorites. Uh, it's definitely efficient, but it's, it, that, my brain doesn't like it. My brain would rather go to Google and say, how do I do this? Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. So uh, display filters are obvious, um, different ways that you can do it. I put up the ASN number for the GOIP and the country one uh, because those may be things that you want to utilize. Uh, if you think that uh, the traffic is coming from you know, one of the, the obvious countries, Russia, China, whatever, right? Uh, wherever the, the latest group of, of malware threats is coming from, you can actually generate a, a stack of filters that will handle that particular piece of information and present you with those. So you can really quickly rule out, okay, it's not Russia. All right, so the display filter macro. Uh, this, in, this picture here shows an example. Uh, I just real quickly created a, 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 known, um, a known filter. I'm sorry, a man in the middle filter where basically what I'm looking for is an ARP with the opcode of two, uh, which is that response. 
that says, typically you have the who's at whatever, and then opcode two is whatever is at this particular address. So what I've done is I've gone in and I've generated what I call a, a man in the middle or eavesdropping attack um, rule that says I only want to see that so and so is at this particular uh, MAC address um, if the IP address that they're claiming happens to be my gateway and the source MAC address is not the MAC address of my actual gateway, right? So then if somebody's trying to spoof the, the uh, IP address of the, uh, not spoof, but uh, hijack, I guess would be a better word, hijack the, the address of the gateway, pretending to be the gateway to all the clients so that they can do the man in the middle attack, um, this will cause them to show up because nothing else will show up in that particular search or in that particular um, packet capture except for what matches that particular um, rule. Then what I did is below that, I had this big long list of, of stuff that I know about that I don't want to see. I don't really care about ARP most of the time. I don't care about STP most of the time. Definitely don't care about DHCP v6. I don't personally. Uh, you might, right? Don't, I'm not worried about browser protocol stuff or anything like that. So I put that together and I added in the display filter macro for the man in the middle. So now I'm going to see that attack if it happens, but I'm also filtering all this stuff out. And then, of course, the logic everybody here has already figured out the logic on that particular one. I might as well just have it man in the middle, right? But I put the or in there so I can see any traffic that shows up that doesn't fit in this one, or I can see that man in the middle attack, right? So that scenario, I mean, do you have Wireshark just running all the time, or is this some type of alert? You, you can have Wireshark running all the time uh, in this. You can uh, also have it to where, uh, like for my personal computer at home, it's set up that when it boots up, it automatically starts a rolling packet capture, stores that information into a folder, and I think I think I have it set for um, no more than, I think it's rolling on 10 at 150 megs each, and then I have another script that goes in and checks to make sure there's not more than 15 files in there, deletes the oldest files, so I never have more than 15 files in there. Uh, and if something goes wrong, then I can just go to the latest packet in or latest capture in that packet or in the folder, pull it out and then take a look at it through Wireshark. But yes, it is possible for you to do um, just have Wireshark running on a on a on a screen into a tap and it's just scrolling all the time and you can look over and go, hey something's happening. Uh, these same filters can be worked with TCP uh, or T Shark as well. The the filters will work to pull from the same profiles. Did I answer your question? Okay. All right. So here is a display filter macro example of the process that I would go through. So the idea is that in this particular one, I don't want to see anything from 67.325, which is obviously a fictional IP address, right? .123.122. But I want to make sure that that's all that I'm blocking out. Is I could set up this rule and say no, but now I'm blocking out more than I expected to. So I already, I've already tested ARP and I've already tested LLM and R to make sure that those are only going to be blocking ARP and LLM and R. Now I want to make sure that when I set this rule up, I'm only going to be blocking traffic from 67 dot fake address, right? So once I have that and I see I'm only looking at these IP, this IP address over and over and over again, then I can go in and I can add the not to it, and now I don't have to worry about seeing that anymore. But it's an important step that you do it this way so that you don't end up writing a bad filter, not realizing you wrote a bad filter, and wondering why you're not seeing the traffic that you were expecting to see or not see. Does that make sense? All right, uh, coloring rules. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. Coloring rules are pretty obvious to me. Um, this one, I put that up there because I, I needed one extra bullet um, just to make this slide look you know, full and fleshed out. Uh, but it's, it's kind of silly 
when you think about it. Uh, the concept behind the blackout trusted ones is you create a filter that is all the stuff that you know is good, and then you change the color code so that the background and the foreground are both black, so you don't see anything. And all you see is this little black screen, and then when something happens, boom, whatever it is kind of sticks out because it's on it's the only non-black thing on the entire screen, right? That's kind of the idea, but at the same time, if you just filter it to where nothing shows up except for that one thing, well, when that thing pops up on your screen, you're like, oh, well, there's something on my screen now, because it used to be white, and now it's not, right? But I figured I'd put it up there to spice up the slide. Um, you can do other things, color coding based on the country of origin. Uh, I like this one because if you can't actually filter out say Russia, because you're doing stuff with Russia, uh, or whatever, or you, your company has a policy against you blocking IPs just because, you can at least have this set up and it, it'll make those things pop out for you. Hey, this is Russia, or this is Iran, or this is, uh, I don't know, uh, Antarctica, wherever the latest attack is coming from. Or in the case of my example, Italy, because you know Italy is really bad with hacking people. Huh. All those princes over there, right? All right, <clears throat> so GOIP, we talked about this uh, at the beginning. I put a little asterisk on this because uh, although this is Wireshark.org, I haven't looked to see if they have an updated version for, for the new version of Wireshark. This one still utilizes the, the older version. I know Jasper has a recent write-up yeah. with a new yeah. version on his site. On his site? All right, um, let's do this. What's the site? Packet what? Is it dot com? Dot com. And it's probably with a C in there, huh? Like that's it right there. So blog.packet-foo.com and you can get that uh, site. We'll put that in there for posterity's sake. And you can also go to going to open. Oh, back one. I'm trying to do the control enter, but it's not seeming to work. Uh, either way, you can go back to you can go to the MaxMind site, go to their open source data section. Don't go to the other stuff because you're going to have to pay for that. So it depends on how up to date you need it to be. But for your own personal, go to the open source page, um, and you can you can get the instructions from them there as well. And just so those of y'all who haven't had a chance to use it yet, just to show you kind of what it looks like, uh, let's see if we got, okay. Let's go some site so we can see it. That's a little strange. What's that? I'm just trying to figure out why my uh, why HTTP isn't bringing anything up. Uh, it doesn't matter. Here, here's. Uh, Here's one here. So, plus sign, and then we'll make this part smaller. And you can see right here, Dropbox, but it, it 
It actually breaks out that it's in San Francisco. It gives me the ASN number, um, even tells me who owns it. Uh, and that's the GOIP. All right. We'll skip past the video of it. And we'll talk about uh, ways for you to quickly get a list of IP addresses that you can go in and try to validate for whether or not they're good or they're bad. Um, who in here has a site they like to go to when they find an IP address that they want to figure out if it's good or bad? Anybody? All right. How many of y'all have ever tried to do that? To validate an IP address? Okay. All right, a couple of y'all? Well, good. Then maybe I'll actually be able to teach y'all something. All right, so with the conversations and the endpoints and all that, it's all under statistics. All right, so we go in here. If we go to conversations, what we get to see, obviously, is who's talking to whom, right? So it's one place that we could go to see um, what the IP addresses are so that we can actually go and try to validate those IP addresses. Uh, another one is endpoints. We go to endpoints, and at this point, we're just going to get a long list of IP addresses. So if, uh, if you happen to work for a company and the company has one of those uh, validation contracts with the companies that do that that allow you to submit a large number of IPs at once, then you can just go in, copy all these IP addresses into a file, submit it, and then get your results back uh, rather quickly, right? The other option you have is you actually have to go to those sites. So let's uh, take an example of one. Move that over here. And we'll leave you there. And we will go to I'm going to cheat real quick and grab, grab one of the uh, Not gonna look. Just type it in. It was com and not net, right? All right, so here, we'll just take this address. We type in that address, we get to find out who it belongs to, um, and through this, sorry, Cortana has her own thing to say right now. Um, so we're, we're able to go in and take a look at the IP address, find out who owns it. Um, if we go to one of those sites that does the like spam house and stuff like that, we can use that to say, okay, this is a known bad IP address or we don't know anything about it, right? Uh, the downside to trying to create a filter that puts out everything we know is good is that IP addresses tend to change, right? Uh, ASNs don't change uh, nearly as much as IP addresses. Uh, then you have problems like uh, Amazon. How many of y'all would say that Amazon itself is a trusted company? You wouldn't really worry about the data that you see going back and forth between you and Amazon. Most of you, right? What else does Amazon have that would make you cringe at the idea of just saying anything that belongs to Amazon is okay? AWS. AWS. So they actually share out their services to people that may or may not be uh, honest, right? So, or somebody has a great site, they're an honest person, but if you happen to be in the uh, previous class um, and you heard him talking about a site that got hacked and then people put up malware on that site, right? So then you have to deal with that kind of thing as well. Uh, so you have to be very careful how you utilize these to create that, that nice nirvana, if you will, of, of sites and or IP addresses and ASNs and everything that you know are good so that you can block them out. All right. OK. 
Okay. So uh, obviously Wireshark is a great uh, place to go to find out about protocols that are supported, how to create filters specific to protocols. Uh, protocols are one way that you could go about ensuring that you, you've got a good filter. Um, if you know that the stuff that you're going to with Amazon is supposed to be HTTP and, and not some other random uh, protocol like BGP or something like that, uh, then you can generate filters to, to help limit that. All right, some uh, websites that you can go to. Uh, if you have questions about RFCs because you're looking at the traffic, you're trying to understand how the traffic is supposed to function, you're looking for an anomaly within that particular type of traffic, something that will help you create a filter very specific to a specific type of traffic, um, that's where you're going to go. All right. These are some examples of, of the kind of pages that you'll see when you go to the, the reputation sites. Right. Um, Siren is one. Uh, I don't know if Siren's still around. Uh, but they'll, they're one that would actually pop up and say, hey, this is a, this is a, a spammer or this is, you know, we don't know who this is because they've never been put in our database. All right. Uh, another place you can go is to the actual IP address registries. Uh, most of the time you go to the one-stop shops and they, they handle all this for you. Uh, sometimes this information can be a little bit out of date. Um, not very much, but a little bit. Uh, sometimes you have to be careful, like uh, LACNIC doesn't have, uh, doesn't require HTTPS and there's something wrong with their uh, certificate right now um, for HTTPS. Uh, so it could be potentially spoofed. Uh, so you have to be careful with those kinds of things as well. All right, so real quick video. Um, I'm probably going to have to give up my Wireshark.ninja uh, domain at some point, but uh, I was at a conference, at this conference a few years ago and was talking with the developers and I was like, anybody want it? No? Okay, I just bought it. Um, so here's me trying to go to Russia. I think I picked cars.ru or something like that. And then... Uh, I'm currently looking for one that's in Russia. And there it is. So now if I take that same IP address and I go to Aaron, Aaron's going to tell me that this belongs to another registrar. It's not going to show up in Aaron. Um, so it tells me I have to go to write if I want to know what's going on. So that's one of the other downsides to doing it this way. Um, but you go to write, do the same basic thing. If anybody feels seasick right now, I'm sorry. All that zooming in and out made my head hurt. All right, there we go. There's our information on cars.ru. I will stop that there and move on forward. Okay. There are also sites out there that can allow you to create um, an entire um, filter that's just strictly for a particular, uh, particular country. Uh, a while back, I was an idiot when I first started doing this. I created a filter that was all of the IP addresses that were in a block, kind of like you would do in a firewall, right? Well, I mean, that's a lot to throw into the memory. And it, my computer didn't like it. Wireshark didn't like it. Um, so I'm talking with the developers, and they're like, well, why don't you just filter based off the country? You can do that. And then, of course, you can. So um, you don't have to go this route, uh, but this route is an option uh, if you're going for a small enough country. All right, uh, reputation, we talked about it before. These are the sites. Uh, uh, that I was trying to get to before uh, that you can go to to check the validity of the IP. Now, this is not a catch-all place either. It's still crowdsourced. So if they haven't been told about it, that doesn't mean that it's, it's good.
but obviously you're only going to put stuff in your in your uh, filter that you know is good. Uh, this just helps you really quickly go, yep, that's not good. All right. Any questions about that? All right. Some one-stop shops, places that you can go to get um, everything at once. I, I will warn you with MX Toolbox. Sometimes it's a little it's a little uh, flighty. Uh, you'll go to it and then you'll click on the thing to go check a certain uh, site and it'll be like, I don't know what you want to do. Um, something is missing and it puts it in there. Uh, usually what I do is I just reload and try it again and everything works. You want me to leave that up for a second? Okay. Just so you know, this was, this was only a, a, a couple of Google requests away. Uh, most everything that's in here is just you type in reputation and you can find it. Okay. You good? Going twice, sold. All right. Uh, some places that you can go to find out about port assignments. So you're looking at traffic, you see a port, port number 123, and you're like, uh, what the heck is 123? Uh, you can go to these locations to get more information on it. Now, you know, the registered ports, the known ports, 0 to 1024, they're supposed to be assigned as very specific types of services that sometimes get hijacked. Um, it used to be those were the only ones that you could count on for knowing exactly what they are. Uh, but since then, I mean, 3389, you can, put, you can find that one out there. Um, They've got a whole list of who's using it most commonly. Um, and the advantage you have there when you're trying to determine is this good traffic or is this bad traffic is you take a look at the traffic, you see the IP address, you see the port, then you go look at the actual data that's showing up and then you magically ma uh, match that up with the data that's inside. Well, plain text data shouldn't be visible when you're going to XYZ port or the port is 23, which is Telnet, so I should be able to see what I'm looking at, but I can't read this because it's encrypted. That's what happens when they don't match up, right? So then that tells you this might be, might be bad. So you don't want to put that into your filter as something that is good. All right, so inside the packets. Um, how many of y'all have ever used the follow TCP stream before? All right. Raise your hand if you've successfully used the follow SSL stream. One. Sometimes. Well, successfully, even if it's only once, I'm happy with it. All right. Did y'all use the SSL key log file method to do that? Yes. Okay. Uh, how many of y'all we're not aware that you can actually look at SSL browser traffic with Wireshark. Like you can actually read the plain text. Everybody was aware of that? Okay. All right. So um, this SSL key log file is a uh, environmental variable that you set. It's literally SSL key log file and you set it equal to a text file location on your computer. When you start Chrome or you start Firefox, I don't know if Edge does it or not. Does anybody know? Um, no clue. I don't, I don't use it. But uh, when you start them, they look in the environmental variables for that. If they find it, they record the key information that you need in order to decrypt data into the file. Right? So then you go into Wireshark, and we're going to do that here in a second. Uh, you go into Wireshark and you tell Wireshark where that file is, and then you have the ability to, to decrypt the uh, SSL traffic. Now, who can see the security concern in that? So there, there is a concern, but um, it's probably not something you want to have on all the time. Um, if you can help it, you don't, but at the same time, um, it's not too significant if it's your local computer and you're, you're taking charge of, of, of keeping it clean and, and deleting the file when you don't need it because uh, you don't want to sit there for six months. 
you know, go in there and remove the file once in a while. Um, and the only other downside to it is it is only for the browser. So if you have an application that does SSL communication, but it doesn't do it through a browser, this isn't going to help you. You're going to have to figure out a way to put the private key of that particular server into Wireshark. All right. So let me show you where that's done. As long as I can remember. Uh, so if we go to edit and then we go to preferences. So first edit, then preferences. Then you're going to go to protocol. All right. Everybody up, up to speed with me, those of y'all that are going to follow along. And then you're going to scroll all the way down to SSL. I don't know, maybe you can hit S. Yep, you can. Hit S and it'll skip you down a little bit. So you find SSL, click on SSL, and in there you're going to see different things related to SSL that you can do with Wireshark. The pre-master secret log file name is where you're going to go in to make sure you put the name of that file that you pointed the SSL keylog file environmental variable at. Does that make sense? Okay. Once you've done that, then you have the ability to go in, you click on the right file or the right packet, right click on it, file TCP or uh, SSL stream, and it'll decrypt it for you. All right. I'm sometimes successful at it because sometimes I hit the wrong frame. I can't, uh, the, figuring out exactly which one of the packets is the right one, I have not been able to figure out yet. It's just trial and error until I can read what, it's, what I see. Uh, at least it has been in the past. All right, so any questions about the SSL key log? No? All right, so one other issue that you might come across when it comes to helping you determine what's good and what's bad and generating your... your um, Pack, uh, your, uh, your filters is things like you've been infected already, right? So now you've got a, uh, a hook in your, uh, in your computer, like a rootkit, right? So how do you get around that? How many of y'all are familiar with what a rootkit is? A couple of y'all? All right. So a rootkit is basically some malware that's gotten a hold of the kernel and it's got its hooks in the kernel in such a way that it now sits between you as the user and the kernel. So when you make a request, the kernel goes to the hardware and says, hey, I want to know what's here, right? And the hardware kicks it back to the kernel and the kernel feeds it up to you. Well, the rootkit sits in the middle and when it receives it, it's basically just saying, okay, you're allowed to know about that, you're allowed to know about that, this never existed, you're allowed to know about that, right? So it makes it difficult for you to be able to identify those things. So how do you get around that? Anybody? All right. Basically, you're going to want to use a tap. And I carry one of these around. I don't work for John. John's awesome. I don't work for him. Um, but, and I'll pass this around, let you guys look at it. All it is is a little pocket switch. It functions just like a switch, but it will also mirror anything going in one port out the other ports so that I can plug in my laptop to it, plug in the internet directly up, and then I can plug another laptop into the switch and I can collect everything that's going across uh, that wire from my laptop. So it doesn't matter that it's infected and not showing anything on its screen because it can't hide the data it's actually sending out, right? Make sense? So it's kind of like you're man in the middle in yourself, but you're doing it from the outside. Um, that way, when, uh, when you're collecting the data, it can't hide from it, right? Uh, does anybody have any questions so far what we've, what we've uh, gone over? I know I went really fast. Um, you guys seem to be picking it up pretty quick. And I didn't want to make you guys go to sleep while I repeated myself 10 times. Uh, how far ahead are we? Way far ahead. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions at all? On the SSL keylog? Uh-huh. You said, I 
I've done that. It seems like sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So the problem that I have found with the doing that is it, it's always right into the SSL keylog file. Um, that's not where the problem is. The problem is knowing which one of those packets to right click on and say follow TCP string or follow SSL string. Um, that's, that's the part that it's, you got to make sure you get wherever that key exchange is starting so it knows what to go look for uh, in, in, that, in that key log file. Did everybody hear his question? Okay, so he was saying that sometimes when he uses that SSL key log file variable, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and it's unfortunately, it, it kind of is how it is until you figure out exactly which packet within that particular stream is the one that contains the, the information you need to point to where in that file your private key is. Uh, that's, it's a trial and error thing. Um, I think you have to get right there at that, at that cipher exchange. Uh, I think that's where it's at. Uh, it's the most logical place to me uh, would be the cipher exchange. Anyone else? All right, well, let's, uh, let's take a look real quick. Um, before we do that, just so you know, we would like you to do the survey, tell them how great or how horrible I am um, so that they can determine whether or not I'm allowed to come back next year. So remember, my fate is in your hands. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, say whatever you want to in there. Just be honest and truthful. Uh, I'll appreciate it. Uh, I've been teaching for a long time. I always love it when somebody says, hey, you did this too much, you didn't do this enough, you walk too fast, you talk too slow, whatever. I'm okay with it because I can only get better, right? Um, so please fill out that survey uh, while we go over some, some of the functionality with the uh, display filter macros so we can actually do it here together. Um, and then that way Janice is happy because she has all of the, the surveys. All right? Raise your hand if you're going to do it. Keep your hand up if you're lying to me. Okay, just checking, you know. All right, so if we go to analyze in the top, you'll see that there's display filters and you can actually go in and you can manually edit your filters. How many knew you could do that? A couple of y'all did? All right, well, let's do it anyway. So in here, I can actually go in and I can see the filters that I have by name and I, I can edit them, I can change them, I can add new ones. So if I imported a group or had a bunch of filters from somebody else, I could actually go in and import those into, in, into here, right? So then the display filter macros oops, are a little bit different. So I had to go in and make some modifications. Uh, you can see some of these still have the old version of the GOIP. I haven't adjusted them all yet. Um, but there, here's an example where if I do dollar sign Microsoft, I will only see those packets that happen to exist within those particular ASNs of Microsoft. Uh, so if I do that, and the way it works is dollar sign, open curly brace, whatever the name of your filter is, and then close curly brace. Now, the nice thing about this is if you type this in just like this and it doesn't go green, there's something wrong with your filter because it is literally applying the filter rule here, right? I haven't hit enter yet, so it's not actually been applied to what's down here, but it's just like any time you type in a filter, it's red until it's valid. Same thing happens here, right? So now the only frames that we're going to see are frames where our packets that we're going to see are packets where I'm communicating with Microsoft directly. Okay? Make sense? So as an example of what happens when they're not right, uh, let's do app nexus. So dollar sign, open curly brace, app nexus, close curly brace. All right? And let's double check and make sure I didn't misspell it. They are case sensitive. I did misspell it. So it shows up red, and the reason it shows up red is because that filter is an invalid filter with the new way that GOIP is being performed. If I go in here and I correct it,
don't know why I have two parentheses around that one, but we'll do that. Whoops. Well, ain't that a pretty sight? I think I just crashed it. Now dollar sign app nexus. See how it turns green now because the filter is actually valid, right? And you can use this just like you would any other filter. If I wanted to say that or dollar sign open curly brace Microsoft, right? Now I'm only going to see that traffic that happens to be, um, you know, Microsoft or app nexus. Right? Or I, I, can, I can set it up any way I want to, and I can daisy chain as many of those as I want to. In a display filter macro, I can actually create a display filter macro of a bunch of display filter macros. Right? They, they function like any other macro or any other filter. Just like I'd say ARP and no ARP and no LLM and R, I can also say no man in the middle and no Microsoft. Um, and I can create a new display filter macro that includes that. All right. Any questions? So can you uh, create variables inside of those things? Are going to be directed to static? No, I don't think you can create variables. I use the term variable because that's kind of what's happening here, but it's not really a variable. It's, it's a constant. Yeah, so it's a way of creating a set of display filters that you can mix and match. Uh, Right, and you can also look at it and say, I know what that filter is about, yeah. right? That's Microsoft, that's obvious. Yeah. I want to wrap my head around display filters. Uh -huh. I want to wrap my head around display filters. It's a kind of straightforward concept. Why would you use display filter macros? Uh, so, aside from the fact that it's nice and tiny on the screen, and it does, it's not really long and, and drawn out, how often do you write a filter that's really long and takes a while to get correct? So once you have it correct, you don't want to have to recreate it. So you create the display filter macro with a common name that allows you to know exactly what that filter is for. And then all you have to do is apply that, that display filter macro instead of having to write that long thing out. Or instead of having to have 432 different uh, filter macro or filter buttons, right? Uh, and you can actually use display filter macros to create buttons too. Uh, when you say self-referential, uh, you, you don't. It wouldn't like the dollar sign Microsoft wouldn't refer to itself. Yes, yes, you can do that. Uh, you can generate a filter, uh, display filter macro that has multiple others in there. I mean, you could also just copy and paste the other one in and just keep on going. But uh, this way, once you have a filter that you know works, then everything you're dealing with is in that filter. And then it's all encompassing itself, so it becomes its own statement. And then you add something else to it, it's its own statement. So they're, they're seen as two different sentences. So you can put your not in front of it or whatever you want to in front of it. Make sense? OK. Anyone? Yes? Do you have good reference that shows how to write these macros? See, if you just said good references, like you wanted to hire me, I was going to say yes. <laughs> but no, you had to add the rest in there because you wanted to be relevant to the, I like it. Uh, so I don't have any references for how to write display filters, which is all a display filter macro is. It's just a display filter. The difference is that it, it can use common names. So um, this is what a display filter macro looks like. It's literally just a filter, and it has a name. 
And that name, you just put the name inside two curly braces with a dollar sign out, out in the front of it, and it becomes a display filter macro. So um, if, you, if you've got a, a, a favorite place to go for learning uh, or for writing good display filters, then you've got what you need. All right. Anybody else? With ORs, yes. Currently, it's 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 App Nexus or Microsoft. So either either one of those ASNs will be displayed. Although I I don't know why I put. It. I think I was going through an old one and I found oh hey App Nexus we'll just create one with that. Uh, in fact, it's apparently its ASN number is or AS number is uh, twenty nine thousand nine hundred ninety. So. Relatively unknown compared to the uh, Quest with its 209. Anybody else got a question? All right, so either you had no idea what this entire talk was about, or I've done a very good job of making sure everybody understands what this talk was about. I'm going to lean to the second one because that makes me feel better and I can sleep better at night. So on the, on the filters, the dollar sign content there, that's not the interesting traffic. You have to put the existing macro that you create. Correct. So the way, the way that um, display filter macros work is you have, your, like, you have your display filter that you've created, and you give it a special name. And once you've given it that name, that name becomes the, 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 the constant. If those of you all that know programming, it becomes the constant. And the way you identify the constant is dollar sign open curly brace, the name of the constant, and then close curly brace. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I can't hear you, I'm sorry. And, oh, the way that the way that I typed in IP dot and it showed me what options I had. Is that what you're asking me? All right. Let's just do what you're asking me. So go to the find right here. No, it's it's actually looking for. A, a, a valid display filter name. IP dot desk address would, uh, or whatever would, would be. So I would actually have to know it was in the Microsoft one to be able to start building it out. Um, but no, that display filter there, as far as I know, that only functions for creating actual filters. Uh, it won't say, oh, hey, just so you know, you happen to have this filter called Microsoft. No, I won't do that. At, le at least based off of this quick trial, uh, it won't do it. Anyone else? And you don't just have to come up with questions just to stay in here. I mean, I can let you guys out early so you get front of the line privileges for, for uh, food. Provided, of course, and I'll get you just a second, provided, of course, I get Good reviews. I'm just kidding. Yes? This talks about baselining. You basically have to baseline a system which is basically uh, still pristine, right? What's it going to be? That's, as well, anyway, but that's yes. The ideal way to do it is to, when you get a fresh machine, hook it up to the internet, collect traffic outside of it and inside of it, and use that, that data on another computer to determine what's good and bad for it. That would be ideal. Um, but at the same time, you could, if, if, you, if you were desperate to, you could conceivably do that now. Um, the nice thing about doing it now is you've installed all this other software that you're using. So rather than having to keep on adding in new stuff to the filter, you could just do it all at once. Yes. Uh, guidelines to create what? To create, uh, to kind of 
create the swap with your, uh, your asset alligators. So the first step for me is once I've created the capture file and I've saved it, then I go in and I identify all the IP addresses that are available. If you, are, create, if you create a, a start a packet capture and then you start checking to see what's good or bad while that packet capture is still going, you're creating more traffic. And you're inevitably going to be just perpetuating the whole thing, right? Uh, so that's one thing that I would do. Uh, the other is that you, um, you go to the uh, statistics section and you use that to get your list of all the IP addresses that are in there. And you start with alleviating the ones that you know are most likely going to be good ones, right? Do a little research, you find out, okay, Microsoft is currently using these IP addresses for their updates. I can throw that in there. Then you, uh, the other thing you can do is you can go to take a list of all the programs that you have, identify who created those programs, then go find out what the IP ranges are for those companies, check those IP addresses against what you already have in your list, um, and then instead of having to go through your capture, you can preemptively hit it by going the other route. Um, the advantage to doing it that way is that you can get the, the ranges that they have and automatically filter them out. Uh, rather than going this IP address, so you filter that one out, not realizing that one exists within a range of others, and then you hit that one again, but you hit it because it's not the same one you had, but in the same network, and you have to keep going. Um, that would be the method that I would use. Um, unfortunately, there's no magic do stuff button yet that would uh, alleviate that. Although maybe one of you guys will uh, write a program that does it all for you. <laughs> Yes, which is why you have to start looking at the protocols and maybe looking even at the data that's being transmitted. Um, so when you create a filter, it doesn't have to be just what protocol, just what IP address you're using. Uh, it can be based off the data itself, right? So if there's a, a key string sequence that's constantly going out from one company uh, or one application that you're using, you can filter based off of that sequence. Um, you can generate a macro that says, okay, it's this IP address range on this port with frame matches XYZ and only that. Anything else would be bad. All right? Okay. Anyone else? By the way, I paid him to ask me those questions. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Nothing else, huh? All right. So since we have... 30 minutes before I'm supposed to be able to let y'all go, that means you have 30 minutes to come up with the best ever uh, commentation and, and what, what's that thing called again? Surveys, that's the word. Surveys, All right? So I'll, I'll stay up here. Um, you probably turned that off. We're probably done by now. But uh, you probably turned it off like a half an hour ago, didn't you? <laughs> oh, good. Um, so I'll stay up here until 6 or until the room is empty of people that are coming up here. Um, you guys are free to go. You don't have to submit the survey, uh, but you do. Because uh, Janice is standing over there. And she'll, she'll, she wants to see it submitted. No. Uh, yeah, please do submit it. Uh, it's not that hard. How many of y'all actually downloaded the guidebook app? All right. So it's really easy to do. Um, please do it. I can't improve if you don't tell me what I do wrong. Um, I can't come up with new content if you don't tell me what you'd like to see. Um, and Janice can't figure out who you actually want to talk to up here if you don't fill them out. All right. I'll stop harping on it, but fill them out. All right, you guys are good.